So next up, we're going to have Dr. Maureen Hansen come and talk to us a little bit about immune dysregulation in ME-CFS. So she's a professor in molecular biology and genetics at Cornell University. She actually got her PhD at Harvard and did a, post a postdoctoral fellowship there. Um, she is a member of the Open Medicine Foundation Scientific Advisory Board, and she's the director of the Cornell Center for Innovating Neuroimmune Disease. Uh, thank you very much. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks to Open Medicine Foundation for inviting me to uh, come to their science collaboration meeting yesterday and also uh, be able to give you a talk today. Uh, I'm hoping that there will be some opportunities for future collaborations, and indeed I uh, have a potential one already arranged as a result of coming to the meeting. I'm showing here my acknowledgments of my group uh, in my lab that works on MECFS, and uh, the work that I'm going to be describing was partially funded by NIH, but actually largely funded by a private donor and also by, one, by a Cimarron Foundation. Uh, they were our collaborators who provided samples uh, that we could uh, examine. And uh, uh, the physician there, Daniel Peterson, is uh, the person whose, uh, whose patients we were able to uh, obtain blood. So I'm going to start with a, a brief lesson in immunology in order to explain uh, what we did. And we focused in this particular study on T cells. So T cells, uh, precursors to T cells are form formed in the bone marrow. And then they go to the thymus where they mature into two types of cells, CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells. And these are named for the uh, protein that sticks out from these cells, CD4. Uh, and CD8. And they have different fates and different jobs to do in the immune system. So the CD4 T cells uh, are w important for uh, signaling to other cells that uh, there's a problem and they secrete cytokines and they, they activate other immune cells to respond to antigens. These CD8 T cells uh, are, are uh, very important to uh, kill cells that are either infected by pathogens or, for example, for uh, cells that have become cancerous. So both types of cells are very important when they're out there in the circulation. So T cells are made aware of the fact that there are pathogens present by dendritic cells, which uh, present an antigen from a pathogen to the T cell by cell-to-cell -cell interactions. And th this is an important aspect of the immune system, that there are cell-to-cell -cell interactions that alert T cells to a problem in, uh, in the body. Uh, the way this actually works is that there are proteins that stick out from the, the so-called dendritic cells, and they interact with receptors on the T cells. So there's these proteins on the T cells and these proteins on the dendritic cell. And when they interact in a lock and key fashion, it tells the T cell that it's time to become active and uh, do something t about this threat to the body. And we don't need to know uh, much about the specific proteins, uh, but the reason I mention them to you is that they give us an opportunity, knowing about those proteins gives us an opportunity to trick T cells when we isolate them from the blood and put them in a test tube. We can trick the T cells to think that they are actually inter interacting with the dendritic cell, by putting in antibodies that can interact with these proteins on the T cell. The T cell thinks, actually, that there are uh, uh, a dendritic cell here that is telling it to become active, but actually we've just given them some uh, antibodies that interact with their proteins, and we also throw in some IL-2, which is a cytokine, which also can activate these T cells. So we have a way to activate T cells in vitro. The reason we want to study uh, activation of T cells in vitro uh, is that uh, it's an important aspect of immune function. But of course, it's also important uh, the function of the T cells that are circulating through uh, uh, waiting, to be waiting to interact with uh, uh, dendritic cells is also very important. But what happens when the T cell is activated is that you have uh, upregulation of the energy pathways of the cell, glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. In order for the cell to start carrying out its tasks, start replicating, uh, making more T cells when there is a threat present. 
So we have been uh, interested in analyzing the energy metabolism of these T cells. And we've been using a device called the Seahorse Flux Analyzer. It's really not important to know how this flux analyzer works, except to say that it can give us a measurement of glycolysis and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, glycolysis uh, is very important to make ATP. Uh, and it doesn't make as much ATP uh, as, as uh, ha happens in oxidative phosphorylation, but glycolysis is also important for making uh, skeletons for uh, biosynthetic uh, activities. So a lot of molecules are, result from the function of glycolysis. So it's a very important uh, uh, in, in aspects other than merely ATP production. So we, in order to study these, uh, uh, in order to study these uh, T cells, we obtained samples from uh, Cimarron Research in Incline Village. Uh, the, these, uh, this describes our uh, control and MECFS uh, samples that we obtained. Uh, th these people had been ill for a long time in general, and uh, they also had taken a long time to be diagnosed, which is a real problem, as we've discussed previously. We need to have some tests to, to be able to diagnose people more quickly. And these patients were quite ill. Many of you have taken the SF36 questionnaire, and uh, the higher the score on the questionnaire, the healthier, healthier a person is. And you can see our healthy controls are, are pretty good, and our uh, blue uh, CFS patients are not so good. So uh, we analyzed two types of uh, T cells, uh, ones that were taken out of the circulation, and then ones that we had activated in vitro with the, this antibody trick. So we compared the patient's uh, CD4 T cells, uh, oxidative phosphorylation, uh, before activation and then after activation, and uh, of course compared that to controls. And what we found was, using that flux analyzer, was no significant difference between oxidative phosphorylation of the CD4 T cells. We then went on to do this in CD8 T cells, again before uh, and after activation uh, in vitro, and what we saw was, again, no significant difference. So we then decided that we should analyze glycolysis and see if there was any difference in CD4 T cells glycolysis between the patients and controls, and there we did actually see a difference in the activity of the uh, CD4 T cells at baseline before they were activated. So you see here that it was higher uh, uh, in, the, in the controls than in the patients. So there is a disruption in the CD4 T cell glycolysis. And then we also did this in CD8 T cells, and again found that the basal circulating T cells, CD8 T cells, have lower functional glycolysis than the uh, patients, uh, than the controls. So the patients have an impaired CD8 T cell as well. So uh, to summarize what I've just said, we found no significant differences in oxidative phosphorylation, but we did find significant differences in basal glycolysis in both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Uh, we, uh, I don't have time to show the data, but also, uh, if you uh, inhibit oxidative phosphorylation with a drug, in a normal person, what happens is uh, the glycolysis, the normal cells upregulate. So we tested to see if there's any defect in this compensatory glycolysis when oxidative phosphorylation is not functioning uh, properly. And indeed, we found also that the compensatory glycolysis was lower in the CD4 and CD8 T cells. So we also wanted to analyze another type, of, uh, another type of mitochondrial function, which is mitochondrial membrane potential. Now, mitochondrial membrane potential is very important for ATP production. It also informs the cell uh, whether the mitochondrion is healthy or not. The cell might get rid of the mitochondrion if it's not. And it also is involved in signaling uh, to the nucleus of the condition of the mitochondrion. So the way that uh, we can analyze uh, mitochondria uh, of the uh, cells is to use a flow cytometer. And what happens is you stain the cells, in this case with a green stain, that labels mitochondri mitochondria. So 
You stick the, the cells then go one by one past a laser. It excites a fluorescent stain to be green. <laughs> and, and then uh, we uh, can detect that on uh, a green fluorescence detector. So uh, a cell that has a lot of mitochondria is going to have a lot more fluorescence than a cell that has fewer mitochondria. Then we can also label with a different stain, a stain called mitotracker red, and this detects mitochondrial membrane potential. The brighter the fluorescent of the stain, the more membrane potential that exists. So you again send a beam uh, that excites this red fluorescent stain and it, it's detected, and then you can find out whether the uh, cells have good or bad membrane potential. So when we did this with the CD4 T cells, we actually saw no difference in the mitochondrial mass, the number of ma uh, uh, mitochondria in those uh, CD4 T cells, and we also didn't see any difference in the uh, mitochondrial membrane potential. However, when we did the CD8 T cells, we saw that while there was no difference in mitochondrial mass, there was an impairment of, these, uh, of the membrane potential. So the CD8 T cells are uh, impaired in their mitochondrial function. And this impairment occurs both in the circulating cells and after they've been activated in vitro. So we've seen two types of immune dysfunction. Now we have impaired glycolysis and we also have reduced mitochondrial membrane potential uh, in the patients uh, versus the controls. So why is this important? Well, it, the immune system f functions by cell-to-cell uh, -cell communication. This communication can be direct physical contact, or it can also be uh, through the cytokines that are released from one cell and go over to another cell and signal that cell that it should do something. Now these are a, a variety of different immune cells that are present in your circulation. And they send out various cytokines to signal other cells, and they respond to the cytokines from other cells. So cytokines are really form a network within your circulation, telling uh, various uh, immune cells what they should be doing and that they should be responding to uh, a stress or a threat. So another way that uh, the immune system f functions is to actually interact through extracellular vesicles as well as the cytokines. I don't have time to go into a study that we've been doing on extracellular vesicles, but we've become very interested in these uh, uh, extracellular vesicles as, as how they communicate between different cell types and, and how they differ between patients and controls. And so there are three types of extracellular vesicles that are recognized. There are these microvesicles. They're formed by budding from the surface. There's exosomes. So they're formed a different way. And then there are vesicles that are formed when cells are dying. Uh, as they are dying, they release these little vesicles. So uh, while I don't have time to, descri to describe all the, the information we've gained so far, uh, nevertheless, this just shows you a glimpse that there is likely going to be something very interesting uh, with regard to these extracellular vesicles and that we can see that the networks uh, that uh, are disturbed, the cytokine networks are disturbed in these extracellular vesicles. They contain cytokines and those cytokines are important because the extracellular vesicle can go from one cell taken up by another cell and the other cell gets a batch of cytokines. So what we're seeing here is in these MECFS patients, wherever you see red, uh, red shows a negative correlation between one cytokine amount and another. And we see that there's a very different set of negative correlations in the MECFS patients uh, versus the controls. So this is a disturbance in the, uh, in the uh, uh, cytokine network. You can't see very well, unfortunately, on this slide, but also there's disturbance in the positive correlations between one, uh, uh, one cytokine and another. So there really is definitely some some abnormality in the uh, cytokine signaling going on in, in patients. So what we're now uh, doing is we're analyzing these extracellular vesicles in more detail. We've analyzed the cytokines, but we want to analyze these microRNAs. MicroRNAs are very important for signaling because they can go from one of these extracellular vesicles into a cell 
and then turn off the expression of the genes to which they correspond in those recipient cells. So uh, we're actively working on characterizing these uh, microRNAs from, uh, from patients and controls. And the reason that this could be important is this, in the future, might be able to provide a biomarker. I'm showing you an example here of a biomarker uh, that a group is working on for breast cancer. They found a particular microRNA present in extracellular vesicles from breast cancer patients that is not present in normal uh, healthy individuals. So this is the level, uh, the level in normal uh, people, and these are patients. So this could be a marker for breast cancer. We hope we can find something like this for also MECFS. To summarize, uh, to say, what have we learned so far? We have some pieces of the puzzle, and we think that we're beginning to see the nature of the disease, but uh, we need more pieces of the puzzle, potentially funded by the Open Medicine Foundation to do more research. Uh, if we get more pieces of the puzzle, we'll get a better picture of what the disease is. But when we have all the pictures of the puzzle, or many more of them, we may discover that what we think is present is actually something else. Thank you.